On the harm principle, the state is allowed to keep people from doing things that harm other people. In its simplest form, the harm principle just says that if an activity X harms others, X may be criminalized. Now obviously this can be more complicated, and here's just one example of a more sophisticated statement of the harm principle, and it comes from Joel Feinberg. I can't emphasize enough how important it is to remember that the harm principle is only about criminalizing activities which harm other people. It is not concerned with activities in which a person harms themselves. This can get a bit complicated sometimes, but the way really to keep it straight is to ask yourself, um, you know, if we make this a law, who is being harmed and who is going to jail? And if those are both the same person, we're not talking about the harm principle. That would be paternalism. Once again, the, ar the basic argument has exactly the same format. We start off with the harm principle as the first premise, then we assert that some activity satisfies the harm principle, and that lets us conclude that we're allowed to criminalize that activity. And just like the other liberty-limiting principles, to apply this to drug use, we just simply substitute in things about drugs, or the way that they harm other people, in premise two, and try to get out the conclusion that drug use may be criminalized. Here are some examples of the harm principle argument in action. So Bill Bennett thinks that the people highlighted in red here are harmed by drug use. And Wilson gives a slightly different, but still fairly similar list. In order to assess this argument, there are several different questions we're going to have to ask, but most of those are going to be dealt with in the next lecture. In this lecture, I just want to focus on getting clear on what the relevant notion of harm is. So now we're going to be talking about things that all harms have in common. So pause for a bit and come up with some examples of uh, harms. I want you to do this because it's really helpful to have some kind of a list of things that we generally accept as examples of harm so that when we start doing our philosophy we can come back and look and see if and make sure we're not getting too far away from it. So you know ads, you can have uh, specific stuff like harming somebody by hitting them with a truck or you can talk more generally about uh, physically harming them. Uh, it might e actually be good to do more of to make a big list of the first and then see if you can organize them into categories, more general categories. Here's just a few examples that I came up with of standard categories of harm. And hopefully you came with came up with some different ones uh, because it'll be interesting to talk about where those fit in under the scheme that we're going to be describing. In addition to physical injuries, certain kinds of mental distress presume you know most likely count as uh, count as harms of their own. It's just simply not true that sticks and stones will break your bones, but words will never hurt you. That is only said by people who cannot use words very well. And obviously, people can harm you by taking away your stuff. Some really serious harms come about when people damage your reputation, because that impedes your ability to get, uh, get jobs, pursue your career, damages your friendships. And people can harm you by damaging your relationships. So for example, by tricking your friends into hating you or stealing away your boyfriend or girlfriend, all of those things can be significant harms. Finally, the mo one of the most obvious cases is death. It seems very clear that harm, uh, that killing someone is harming them. Now, interestingly, the concept of harm we're gonna talk about today has a well, at least creates a puzzle when it comes to explaining how death could be a harm. Uh, when we get to the end of today's lecture, take a bit and think about it. Think of it as a bonus question, or lots of fun, or something. Now that you have your list of standard examples of harms in front of you, take a minute now and try to think about some of the things that they all have in common. That is, um, what are some of the necessary conditions of being a harm? The first f aspect of harm 
is that harms involve some sort of setback of interest. And by an interest, I just mean it's something you have a stake in, or it's something that can make you better if you have it and worse if you don't have it. So since interests are the kinds of things that make you better off, you know, like having a job is something you have an interest in because that's something that can provide you the ability to do other things that you might want. Because of that, we think that a harm has to involve making you worse off than you were before or worse off than you would have been had the person not did the thing that harmed you. Now that idea, since interests are just defined in terms of stuff that makes you better or worse off overall, um, that's really broad and so hopefully that should cover all of the different kinds of harms that uh, you have in your examples. But try to look at it, look at over your examples real quick and just make sure that you can see in each of them what kind of interests would be set back to check that this is actually a good first part of the definition. Now interests come in different strengths and Feinberg distinguishes between two kinds. One are the ulterior interests, which are these are the things that you kind of like have you you want overall in your life. You want happiness, you want a good job, you want a family. Those sorts of things are your ulterior interests. But what's more important from the point of view of the harm principle actually are your welfare interests. And these are the things that are the conditions that if you don't have them, you're not going to be able to go after the the sort of ulterior things that you want. So, you know, basic health or absence of pain or uh, basic nutrition or shelter or uh, minimal education, some bit of uh, 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 friendships and whatnot. Those are the kind of things that you have welfare interests in. If we agree that an interest must be set back in order for a person to be harmed, we're agreeing that setback of interests are necessary conditions of harm, but are they also sufficient? And so in order to figure this out, what you need to do is try to think of some examples where a person has an interest setback, but where we would not want to say that they have been harmed. One really clear example of harmless setbacks of interest comes with uh, fair competitions. Now, in a sporting competition, both competitors really want to win, and so they both have an interest in winning. But at some point during the match, one person gains the upper hand and only one of the two competitors is the winner. And so thus by, winni by Rhonda winning the match she set back her opponent's interests but she didn't harm her and don't worry as far as I'm aware she didn't injure her opponent either. So what's the difference? What else do we need to give us ourselves a full definition of harm? It probably seems clear that the thing that's missing is that when you harm somebody, you're doing something wrong. And so a harm has to include a, has to be a wrongful setback of interest. When you're in a fair competition and you're not cheating or anything, then if you set back the other person's interest, you're not doing anything wrong. That's perfectly fine. And so that's why winning a race or winning a tournament doesn't count as a harm because it's lacking the the second criteria it it's not it doesn't involve you actually doing something wrong one common account of when a setback of interest is wrongful um, appeals to the idea of rights so on a view like Judy Thompson's or Joel Feinberg's harms involve rights violations take a minute and now think about some examples which go the other way in which a person has a right violated but doesn't have an interest set back. And the reason for doing this is just to see that not all wrong actions involve harms. These are admittedly a bit harder to think of. One common example is a harmless trespass. And this happens, for example, um, if you trespass on someone else's property, but it leave no trace and you cause no damage. So if you cut across the lawn of the house on the corner um, and no one else is doing it and the grass, so the grass isn't getting super worn down or anything like that, um, when you do that, you're violating the homeowner's right 
to control who walks on her property, but you're not setting back of any of her interests because her lawn is no worse off. So therefore, you are not harming her, but you are violating one of her rights. And so it is important to see then that you need both the setback of interest and the rights violation to have an actual harm. So in short, a harm is a wrongful setback of interest. So you know what to do at this point. Take a moment and try to think of some possible problems, or at least some of the things that you think we need to hear more details about um, w regarding this account of harm before we accept it. Here's one example of something that's a problem with the first criteria, with the first bit of the harm principle, the requirement that a setback of interest make you worse off than you would have been otherwise, you know, if you hadn't actually been harmed. And this comes from my old teacher, Shauna Schifrin. Um, she, she says, well, imagine somebody that uh, is like a, like a bored and cruel rich person, right? And so they go around dropping bars of gold on people's feet. And, you know, gold is really, really heavy, but it's also really, really expensive. So, you know, uh, Richie Rich, the, the gold dropper, comes over, and you're just staring there, and he's like, yo, and you're like, what? And he's like, bam, and throws the, br the gold brick on your foot. Well, you know, it breaks your foot, and it hurts an awful lot, but hey, now you've got a you know, quarter million dollars, or a million dollars, or however much that's worse, worth. And you say, hey, man, you just harmed me. That's not cool. Why did you do that? And he said, I didn't harm you. You say, well, what do you mean? You just broke my, you just broke my foot. And he says, well, no, look, did you have a million dollars, you know, 30 seconds ago? And you, you know, and you say, uh, well, well, no, I didn't have a million dollars 30 seconds ago. And he says, well, now you have a million dollars, don't you? Says, well, yeah, now I have some million dollars. He says, well, clearly you are better off than you were before I dropped that brick on your foot. And you go, okay, yeah, you're right, I am better off. He says, well, look, in order to harm you, I have to make you worse off. So clearly I didn't just harm you. And you go, damn, I need to add something else to my criteria for harm. There's a lot of things that you might try to add in here, and it gets pretty complicated pretty quick. And so we're going to skip over all that and just assume that that's a problem that can be fixed. And so in everything we do, this is our definition of harm. I want you to be unreasonably picky about this. For the rest of our, anytime we are to discussing harm, just pretend that this is the only concept of harm in the whole world. Don't, you know, s if w it turns out that something is not actually a harm under this definition, well, then even if we would want to say, if intuitively it seems like it should count as a harm, it doesn't. We need, unless we have a different definition, we have to say that those things which do not get covered by this concept cannot count as harms and therefore cannot be the kind of things, cannot give us the kind of reasons for criminalizing something that the harm principle uh, wants us to be giving. Okay, so then we can rewrite the harm principle if we want to say something like this, right? We just substitute in the criteria for harm in, s in for the word harm. So uh, if a person doing some activity sets back at least one of another person's interests and that other person has a right not to have that interest set back, then she has been harmed. That activity X is a harmful activity, and we're justified in criminalizing X. This means that we now have a test, or at least a checklist, that we can use when we're trying to figure out whether or not the harm principle covers something. So for any alleged harm involved with drug use or anything else, we need to answer all of these questions. And if there is a real setback of an interest and a violation of a right, and it does not um, conflict with the presumption of liberty for the government to be involved, then we have a really good reason for criminalizing drug use.